Hello, hello. Let me do a Sunday Reads uh, for this August the 1st. Um, August the 1st in Canada has been declared, um, in March it was declared, as Emancipation Day, uh, which is Canada joining, joining very late uh, in the day of uh, recognizing that uh, in August of 1834, the, uh, it's the, uh, the uh, Slavery Abolition Act of 1833 was, came into effect across the British Empire, abolishing slavery. Um, uh, Canada had practiced slavery uh, all the way back from like the 1600s, uh, where black and indigenous peoples were slaves, were slaves in Canada. Um, with the with the Emancipation Act, it only freed children under six, and uh, you know uh, people older than that, you know, had to still serve four to six years as apprentices. Um, you know, there was a twenty million dollars in compensation for the slave owners. Uh, there was no compensation for the uh, the enslaved the enslaved themselves. So it was a very imperfect imperfect uh, thing, and obviously not. Not not the not the end of things any more than uh, Juneteenth in the United States uh, signaled just the end of wine and roses. Um, it's been brought in. It's been um, brought in as a, an officially recognized uh, day in Canada. Uh, just generally, there's actually parts of Canada where uh, Emancipation Day has actually been celebrated for uh, a, a long a long while. But it's been finally fe federally recognized uh, as hopefully as a uh, way of Canadians um, to encourage Canadians to reflect and actually kind of educate themselves around uh, this day of realizing that Canada, uh, too, was deeply uh, involved in uh, the uh, transatlantic uh, slave trade, um, while, you know, the number of slaves that we had in Canada was was less, though... <laughs> still still very significant uh we also you know we were also participated in the transatlantic uh slave trade uh we definitely uh, a lot of like the all the goods the slave produced goods from the caribbean were uh, traded up to canada canada deeply enmeshed canada and before it was canada was deeply enmeshed in that economic system that economic driver that that uh that used that exploited uh, exploited slavery and of course yeah the um, that um, that indigenous people in Canada were also not uh, recognized as uh, persons with legal rights and were used as as, sla as slaves. Um, there's a lot there's um, documentation that like about fifty percent fifty seven percent of uh, indigenous slaves in Canada were uh, indigenous women were young young indigenous women uh you know as as as, as young as for as 14 or 13 you know young so it's one of those things it's like it's a good opportunity to uh not try and bury our history uh not uh indulge in the worst canadian habit which is going oh we are so much better than the united states it's like no no we we were not um there you know there's accounts here of like you know in the 18th century when slaves fled Canada for the United States to places like Vermont and New York for for to to get free because those states had actually banned slavery, um, we do actually have the thing in Canada that in uh, 1793 uh, that uh, Lieutenant Governor Simcoe um, reacting to some really abominable uh, cases of abuse of uh, enslaved people, uh, especially a woman a Cooley. Um, uh, was uh, her name was Cooley? I can't remember her first name. Uh, that they actually passed a uh, act to limit slavery in Upper Canada, which uh, made the import importation of uh, slaves illegal, and that current slaves would be freed at 25, which apparently greatly decreased the number of slaves in Canada than leading up to uh, in 1834. But uh, even past that, um, you know, just because slavery gets abolished. Um, there's lots of accounts of um, black people fleeing to Canada, going, "Oh, this is going to be finally going to be free," and encountering horrible racism here, and end up moving on to somewhere else just because, just because it was illegal 
didn't, you know, slavery was legal didn't mean that racism wasn't alive and well in Canada. So it's just one of these things of, it's not to beat ourselves up and thrash ourselves for being, you know, evil, evil Canadians. Uh, sometimes maybe thrash ourselves for being such fucking smug Canadians, but to just, you know, learn, learn about our history uh, and uh, realize exactly how much all this stuff uh, is uh, things to keep in mind now as how we conduct ourselves and what um, that we do that Canada is a place that does have the same uh, same but different uh, history with stuff like racism, uh, slavery, uh, all this stuff that it's something that's worthy to be uh, worthy worthy to be remembered and um, you know it's a small thing but I think it's a wor worthy thing to uh, worthy thing to note note for to this day. Uh, I guess coming closer to home, uh, I'd like to I'd like to mark a couple of little a little anniversary that uh, Brian at Bookish had. Uh, he so celebrated his hundredth episode of his uh, his Saturday Hodgepodge videos, which uh, are a real institution on uh, kind of this corner of BookTube. If you, I, I'm sure the overlap between anyone who watches my videos and Brian's is a hundred percent. So we can all just agree that Brian's weekly check-ins where he'll he'll talk about stuff that's kind of gotten under his skin that he wants to talk about uh issues or you know just what he's reading or his uh his his, his music picks or all that stuff we will will go will uh he he it's just a really it's a it's a lovely thing to have to look forward to each saturday and i like you know thank you brian i, I thanked you already but i did it in my usual clunky way uh, but yeah, yeah, it's like really, that's something to really look forward to each each Saturday, especially when it gets it gets political and gets passionate. I, I do enjoy that. I do enjoy that. And I'm sure a lot of his, lot, most of the other people who 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 watch him, they either hate watch him. But I think majority just love watch, love watch because he's such a uh, calm, clear, reasoned presence uh, on uh, BookTube as uh, someone who's able to to actually string together good solid arguments and marshal his facts in a way that I can only can, can only aspire to. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, the other thing I want to note, because, you know, if you're going to mention Brian, you have to mention Steve Donahue because they are bros together. Uh, and uh, it is Steve's non, non, non reaction to the uh, Booker prize. Um, and it's not so much the, the issue itself. I think, I think I'm, you know, well known Steve's views on, on book prizes in general. He feels like they are not considering uh, strictly literary, uh, literary merits when it comes to books. That indeed that books get on. He feels like books get on these prizes. Uh, it's because they're they're checking off checklists, but they're not checking off what he considers the most important checklist, with, most important thing, which is literary merit. Um, and you know, you can go back and forth on. On on that, I mean, I I think I think book prizes for the most part say more about the people giving out book prizes uh, than they do the books themselves. This is a this is like this is what we feel like is is great literature, and that changes throughout the years. And um, it, there's been a shift. There's been a shift, and whether you agree with that shift or not, I guess is going to be see how much you feel about book prizes. For the most part, I don't really. I've never particularly taken book prizes as a, as a great thing you you have to kind of go with it's like it's like I, I don't know any anonymous body that's not exactly how I'm going to get if I know if I know what Steve thinks about a book then I'm going to have an inkling of okay well I, I've got an idea of Steve's tastes and I can use that to make my own decision about whether I'm going to get a book or not now the reason I want to bring up Steve is because I just love how Steve organizes or doesn't organize his videos because he said he he it, it just it's it starts it started with um what is it the inter the interrail euro rail the interrail euro rail book tag you had to watch that video to find out that he was not going to discuss uh the booker the booker prize and here were his views on the booker prize and then and then you uh the next day you had to li listen to the nobel prize and literature tag to kind of get a little further amplification on that, and hear that he had gotten emails from people saying, "Well, maybe you'll talk about the books," and he's like, "Oh, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know." And then, and then, because you know, you'd be scanning for that topic to come up, you would have had to gone to the 
a July 2021 Mega Stuff video, which was, you know, assuredly stuffed with lots of content, lots and lots of content, where at the very end of that video, he did actually give his, um, some brief opinion, brief opinions on, uh, the, on the books, some of the books in the Booker Prize, because if you give Steve, if, if, if it's a, if it's a prize where the, you know, they, they've, they've, there's like a thousand books. Steve's probably read 900 of them. And now the, the Booker Prize, the Booker uh, judges would have been, it would have got, got access to books that haven't been released yet. And being kind of, um, you know, based across the pond in England, uh, they have probably have access to books that Steve didn't. But I think he still range. I think he had like about five or six books that he could, he had read already because he just, Steve is a, is a critic, book critic who reads everything, who reads it very quickly and very deeply. And he finally gave his, finally, he, he, he gave his views on those books. And you could, you could go to that video to, to hear him, him talk. Spoiler alert. It's not really that, that, that positive on any, on any of the books, but I just, I just, it's like, it's a hilarious, um, if you, if you watch Steve, you have to be all in. You basically, as he expects, you just watch all his videos. He, he does two or three three videos a day. You watch all those videos, which, you know, is not a hard thing to do. But um, I just laugh because that is the that is the only way that you could track his rea his non-reaction. I'm not going to react to the Booker Prize over his not reacting to the Booker Prize over three days, over three over three separate videos. There's probably other videos that I didn't watch. Sorry, Steve, that um, that also maybe had notes on the Booker Prize in there. But I just thought that is that is Steve. Um, I, you know, even maybe if I don't ag agree with him on all stuff, I just I love how he teased his audience. He teased teased you, the audience each day about how he wasn't going to talk about the Booker Prize and talked about the Booker Prize. He just couldn't help himself. He couldn't help himself. So that was that was just so that was just uh, that's that's the some of the fun of, of uh, BookTube. Um, so yeah, let's go on to actually what I read. I read this week. Um, I continued on with Flappers and Philosophers by F. Scott Fitzgerald. I don't think I talked about it last time because I've gone through Bernice Bob's her hair, Benediction, and uh, Dalrymple goes wrong. Oh, that Dalrymple! He he really he really went wrong. Um, which it's it's interesting reading early Fitzgerald stories because uh, having then gone on and read The Great Gatsby, uh, read. Uh, Read read a couple of his other novels. You can really see his those it's kind of the themes in there. I mean, Bernice bobs her hair is almost like it's kind of like influencer culture. It's like you know how to be how to be popular. You know how to be a success successful young woman uh, in a way that really kind of resonates with the day. I mean, you could call it a vapid story, but it's all about presentation and kind of the, that that kind of in mean girl infighting which is like oh my god this this in some ways um wouldn't take too much to kind of update it today uh in a maybe a depressing kind of way because you know he's probably Fitzgerald isn't cheering this stuff on um Benediction which I I think some book critics thought like oh this is the big story of this collection perhaps because uh it's got a it's got a girl who's a young woman who's visiting her monk older brother who she, who you know he doesn't really know her at all and there's a sort of this thing of kind of spirituality in a world that has no use for it use for it and you know how that has kind of like a physical effect on physical effect on her um and also just sort of Fitzgerald's thing of of using uh especially young women as sort of some kind of a, a kind of a symbol something to ho clutch onto as a symbol with a in a really in a way that's just like seems it as 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 kind of as silly as vapid as 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 uh the um the other stuff there um yeah yeah so it, that was like that was that story actually didn't do too much for me and then dalrymple goes wrong um all about a soldier come back from war who um it's actually it's interesting because i think of um post world war ii you get into noir fiction you get into crime fiction where you get all these kind of ex soldiers running around and then maybe having lost kind of uh uh there's no moral compass there anymore and the, all they know is violence and dalrymple goes wrong is sort of an example of that happening uh in in the after the first world war and just definitely the idea of like there's no right and wrong there's just getting what's getting what i want materialism 
uh, which you can also see in something like you know the Great Gatsby with uh, with with Gatsby himself of like you know just getting all the getting all the stuff and how uh, I mean obviously kind of a very moralistic tone of like you know and that being empty and hollow um so yeah yeah that's that's the my my Fitzgerald hits hits for uh, last week and this week um I actually finished um the two books that I think I talked about starting last week uh, the first one being The Mermaid of Black Conch by Monique Rafi uh 2020 uh novel of uh a, um told in kind of both retrospect and in the kind of a present tense of uh, David, a uh, young black fisher uh, on on um, on Saint Constance, the the island Saint Constance, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, you know, out fishing, you know, strumming his guitar, smoking a bit of smoking a bit of ganja, and a mermaid coming up and him singing his holy songs to her, uh, and them falling in love, and um, she turning out to be. A uh, cursed, cursed young woman from like a thousand years earlier, who uh, was yeah cursed, cursed by uh, the women in her, her village for her kind of her uh, sexuality, her her effect on the men around, and uh, doomed to kind of an immortal life as half woman, half fish, uh, more kind of more kind of animal uh, in the thing, and just that it's a wonderful mix. Of, of kind of love and sensuality with also like the history of like you know Achaia's uh, the, the mermaids uh, people have all been slaughtered um, the uh, uh, Spanish conquistadors came and uh, her plate people were uh, exterminated um, and also living on an island where uh, Miss Rain uh, is the last of uh, the white uh, plantation plantation uh, people who live there? Her family bought the plantation post slavery, but there's still very much the thing of she owns all the land, even though she's trying to do right. There, um, there are characters who are really uh, angry, still really angry with her. Like you know, they hate the white people, and when uh, one of them uh, um, delivers kind of a diatribe against her, uh, she's that that woman Priscilla is both the villain, but you also are going. She's not wrong. It's not. It's not wrong. And there's a kind of a hurt there, uh, which extends to Acadia's um, relationship with a black man who grew up with her. They were children and kind of fell in love as children. But as they grew up, they grew up into the uh, that history, that complication. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is probably one I'm going to actually do a review on. Uh, really, really well written. Uh, kind of bounces between. A very kind of close third person to uh, David's journal, to uh, to uh, kind of almost kind of a po prose poem bits from Akaya Ar Ar herself, uh, which all really mix wonderfully uh, in in that kind of the uh, the kind of the language the language used um, because even uh, Miss Rain Akaya uses this kind of uh, the um, the dialect. Of the islands is what she talk she talks in, uh, even though you know um, she's also teaching Akaya to to both talk in the kind of the, the the dialect of the island, but also to read in proper proper English. So there's there's all that kind of mixed in there as well. So that was that was really that was really good. The other thing I finished listening to was the library book by Susan Orleans, uh, twenty eighteen nonfiction work. Uh, which is centered around is cent centers around uh, a 1986 fire that uh, that that was perhaps set uh, in the Los Angeles Public Library, which um, devastated the library. The library was closed for like six years uh, before it was fi finally all kind of put back together, uh, burned like f something like 400,000 books, damaged a whole ton a whole ton more. Um, and it, it centered around that and around sort of one of the, like the main suspect, this, uh, this failed kind of actor delivery boy, uh, a young man, uh, Harvey, Harvey Peak. But it's, 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 um, I, if I, if I can see from like, you know, the orchid thief, Susan Orlean likes to take something like a central event like that, but then she's much more interested in, 
she's she's interested in not just like she's not just interested in the, in the orchid thief guy in the orchid thief she's interested in all the history around and in the library book um it's not called the fire or anything the you know the fire at the at the los angeles public library it's called the library book because it's much more about you know various threads about the fire but about the history of the of this los of the los angeles public library and about the um the present day running of the library she's just fascinated by just how much uh how how much uh how important the library is in the civic running of this place uh and also just in like kind of the history of it there's a the one of the the history history things is the great library war where uh the the library in like 1906 or something like that was being a uh, run was being run by a woman who thought everything was going great went to the um the board meeting it was like oh yeah we're, everything's going great do, wonderful wonderful and at the very end of it uh guy stands up and says ah we we want your resignation it's like why do you want my resignation everything's going great oh because we found a man to run the library and you know that's much more suitable than that and this sparked off a great legal battle uh great protests um to 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 pro to resist resist this um 1906 so maybe you can see how things go and indeed the next guy Loomis uh, who is this man uh, is is uh, is uh, is the one who comes in and it is a great eccentric in himself actually does contribute a lot but there's still that kind of burn of like um, it, so it's it's like it's about the library but it's about kind of the culture the history it's about the library it's about um, how important just you know having all this information here what kind of books were taken out um, each chapter heading hat lists some of the some of the books which kind of then come up thematically within the chapters I think some people were were uh, get get turned off by the fact that this isn't just strictly a, a like a true crime investigation it's the, it's like that's the flavoring that's what Susan Orlean uses as like a little as a little skeleton to then weave everything else around so you have to have um, a great curiosity and enthusiasm for the library for the, this library and just libraries in general which I definitely do so I found this an incredibly compelling uh, listen because I listen to it and Susan Orlean I like it when authors read their books because they're not actorly they don't blah, emote I like just straightforward reading um, and I, I, I listen to this over like two days it's like six hours one day six six hours the next day uh, it was like just really 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 great really great fun fun uh, and because I got through that so quickly I ended up listening to a Terry Pratchett uh, book uh, the we we free men um, uh, the channel Lost in Adaptation, uh, the fellow on there whose name I can't remember, he just did a appreciation of uh, Discworld, the Discworld series. Terry Pratchett, a uh, British fantasist uh, novel, he uh, passed away not not too, not too long ago, and uh, he he created this uh, series called Discworld, which spans oh, I think it's over forty books now, forty books and forty books in the series, all centered around this flat earth world which started out as kind of just kind of a, a satire of, of of kind of like fantasy tropes but then became much more you have newspaper newspaper novels you have uh you have uh crime crime ones with the guards with the uh, sergeant sergeant vimes of the guard series so many different ones uh and now he was an lost and an adaptation fellow he did a great summation of it and he talked about the we free men but he didn't talk about what is i think is my favorite favorite character in uh terry pratchett which is tiffany tiffany aching who is this uh i believe in the first novel a, a nine is a is a nine-year-old girl who um who uh, has to kind of take over from her grandmother uh nanny nanny aching uh who uh, has uh, been kind of the the protecting force uh in this area called the chalk called the chalk because it used to be under the ocean was thousands and thousands of tiny tiny little uh, shelled mollusk creatures that got you know geological time turned into the the chalk of these uh, chalk of these uh these lands and um it's basically it's it's this first adventure is all about the queen of fairies stealing her brother and her having to go and rescue him and it's a very straightforward that way um i think pratchett kind of 
Uh, it calls this, it's called a story of Discworld versus a Discworld novel because it's aimed more at a, more at a younger readership. To be honest, the writing is still as sharp and as dry and as witty as always. Uh, it's probably just the fact that it's centering on a, um, a, a younger, a young protagonist and that it, um, that, and, and that it, uh, that that it is just a single straight storyline. There isn't multiple storylines that you're weaving together, which actually gives it a nice kind of a sharp uh, driving through line. I, I do like my novellas that just kind of like don't fluff around. We just kind of go right straight through on the plot. Um, it has it does have the great comic uh, creation of the Wee Free Men, the Mackinac Feagles, who are red haired uh, six inch uh, creatures covered in blue tattoos wearing tartans uh, uh, and yeah Crivens uh, shouting in Scottish in, in Scottish dialect uh, loving loving of stealing fighting and drinking uh, and then more fighting and then more fighting and more fighting uh, who are who are the, uh, the her helper and who she has to sort of uh, take take control of um, Tiffany is a is a kind of a one of these great uh, Pratchett uh, hero heroes protagonists that she's she's her great superpower is that she can stand back and look at things and then stand back at herself looking at things it's like this second second sight idea uh, and that is that is probably the great the great power of all the witches. Uh, in the Pratchett world, isn't that they can go zap or something, or they can fly? They so they can fly on their broomstick, but more that they actually use their head and think about stuff critically. Uh, it's the power of critical thinking uh, in in a novel, and um, yeah, it's it's also got kind of a sadness of her dealing with the the death of of, of her grandmother. Uh, it's the thing of going maybe I'm not a nice person uh, when Wentworth her 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 perpetually sticky uh perpetually kind of going want to want a sweetie want to go bath want to go you know want to want a sweetie it's like um he's he's like i'm not sad he's gone he's a burden he, he's he's annoying it's like she's she's not your sweet little girl oh my poor brother it's like oh, god he's so annoying maybe it'd be better if he was gone it's like there's a kind of a he she has a sharpness to her and you know she she also does feel sorry about thinking that but she also can stand out of herself enough to go yeah you do think that you do think that which um makes her uh, a great a great a great character and it's just and, the, and yeah the we free men uh re as read by us uh, S stephen riggs is just 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 a f uh, was a fun fun little delight to read um i probably don't have much more to say about that um god uh, and then let me unlock my phone because I've just been going on and on about the We Free Men for so long. Um, and then, and then I need to pick up some more books. What am I going to read next? What am I going to read next? Uh, one of my booktube spins is, uh, was the first one was the HMS Surprise, which is number three in the Audrey Matron series. Um, um, all set in like Napoleonic War. Uh, and I've just read the first little bit where it opens with a meeting of the Admiralty where they basically decide that Aubrey and a bunch of other uh, ships, ca young ship captains, aren't going to get to uh, share in, in the booty because basically he's fallen on the wrong side of, of politics. So I'm sure Aubrey will have to uh, kind of scramble around more. Uh, Matron, the doctor, doctor um, gets brought up very injudiciously by... Uh, uh, one of the uh, by the uh, Lord, the new Lord High Ad new Lord High Admiral, which was really bad thing to do in an open session because he is kind of their secret agent uh, gathering gathering intelligence. So you've got kind of uh, the the numb nuts up 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 at the very top of the thing, which are you know just don't aren't recognizing kind of the great talents they have there. So uh, have just just started on that, but it's. Uh, yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. And I, I looked up droit, so I know what uh, the droit, meaning uh, kind of a legal right uh, or legal, you know, a, a legal right to something because they don't have, the Admiralty has all the rights to uh, to all the booty and uh, poor uh, uh, Aubrey and the rest of the captains do not and are not going to get rewarded for it, which at this point in um, 
going by uh, Patrick O'Brien at this point in um, British naval history that is ba that is how these guys kind of really made their cash that's how you made money and that the things that were going to motivate men to kind of take risks and uh, you know flex the might of the the British and if you're not going to make anything why it by it well love of country is only going to get people so far and uh, that is what the more much more intelligent uh, much more savvy uh, naval intelligence officer who tries to argue for that case uh tries to argue but isn't successful because it's much more about politics than it is about uh actually getting 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 things done uh so that's what i'm going to read that's what i'm going to read physically this week and probably a little bit longer because it's uh, a little bit longer than uh and a little bit smaller text than uh yeah it's like three over 300 pages long it'll probably take you'll probably be hearing me part midway through this next week and i'm also going to listen to uh zadie smith's uh feel free which is a collection of, of her essays it was published in 2018 um and she says in the foreword which is about as far as i've gotten in there that uh you know these were written uh in the before times when obama was uh in power uh and so you know she says it's one of these things of like you'll feel free uh she she invites her her uh, her imagined uh, reader she she imagines she feels says to feel free to kind of take these apart and reassemble them uh, correctly for the situation we are so situations we are in now uh, there's a bit of diffidence in some of these essays which you know you can't have diffidence now when you've got to basically be on the barricades fighting uh, and you know obviously reflecting reflecting the trump trump years and i would say probably even post trump years so it can be interesting to hear hear listen to listen to these these essays i've i've, I've heard her recommended a lot for almost more for her essays than for her her um lit even though i can see that below me holding up the camera here i've got her on beauty so maybe um i will balance out balance out uh, some of her essays with actual reading of some of her fiction as well because i i read i've read some of her fiction uh it's like white teeth yes probably white teeth because that's below it i've read white teeth i can't actually remember too much about it but that was probably at a before booktube time when i would read stuff and then it would just drop right back out of my mind again afterwards because i didn't have to talk about it and think about it here so yeah that's that's basically what i've been doing this week i've also been i also uh because I've, I'm a loyal listener to a Linoleum Knife, uh, a podcast of the film of of the film and cinema, that I um, I've been watching Hell's a Bopping, a uh, 1941 film adaptation of the Broadway music musical, uh, starring Ole Olison and Chick Johnson with Martha Ray and uh, Shemp Howard, a really kind of uh, bizarre fourth wall breaking musical. Just the first. 10 minutes of this is just chaos uh and you're jumping from uh from kind of like uh in the in the projection booth into the film onto the 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 the, the, the uh onto this the studio floor walking through various sets just bizarre 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 uh musical which is on youtube i'll leave a link down to below if you're if you're looking for a really um, kind of Looney Tunes, uh, true Looney Tunes, a predecessor. Uh, I think it's predecessor, 1941, probably, probably predecessor of uh, Looney Tunes. That would be great. And uh, the the song, a la Brian, the song that's in my head at the moment is a sweat pant boots, which I also picked up from uh, Linoleum Knife, which is um, Iceland's uh, ingenious, ingenious original. Um, campaign where they they invited a uh, very select few I think it's like three a day people that tourists to come into a shop in Iceland uh, bring in their sweatpants by you know in July uh, and they would get their sweatpants you know those those um, lockdown sweatpants you've been wearing all that time turned into uh, sweatpant boots over I think over a, a t take about a day, and they they would they turn them into sweatpant boots. I don't really care about that. It is indeed the song "Sweatpant Boots, Baby." You got you just gotta. I'll leave a link to that, or have a little thing here that you could click to. Is it gonna be sweatpant boots? Is it gonna be hell's a poppin'? You decide. Uh, one is much shorter than the <laughs> the other, or do both, 
or do both. So yeah, that's my week. That's my entirely too long of a, a chat, weekly chat. Uh, if you, you know, if I had had the time to edit it down, I would, but I don't. So it's 35 minutes about that. So yeah, check out Brian, check out Steve, um, more videos later.